uh, thank you for, again for that introduction. Can I acknowledge Brian Stanley, who I've had dealings with over many years, uh, Dr John Tanner, uh, who I've also had dealings with for a number of years. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, can I thank you also uh, for supporting Christchurch by being here three weeks after, after the, that, uh, that terrorist attack, which I think shocked us all. Um, I, um, it, it's sort of, it's impossible as a, as, a, as a politician really to be in Christchurch. This is actually the first time I've been in Christchurch since that event. We haven't wanted to sort of uh, plague Christchurch with too many politicians. Um, uh, but I have to say that the response in Christchurch and throughout New Zealand, in my view, has been inspiring. Um, uh, led, of course, by the Prime Minister, responded to so exceptionally well by the Muslim community uh, and by the wider New Zealand community in general. And I believe that our response uh, has so obviously been one of uh, kindness and inclusion rather than uh, hatred and division. Uh, I think we can all be proud of that, and I'm sure uh, we've all been reflecting, I know that I have been, on how we can, each of us, be more inclusive in our workplaces and in our communities so that we make good from this uh, horrendous atrocity uh, that occurred. And I'm sure a lot of you in your workplaces over the next few years will be doing that, and I thank you for helping. Anyway, to business. Uh, it's a well-traversed story that New Zealand uh, depends upon exports for our uh, prosperity. Uh, partly because of our geographic isolation, New Zealand's export and import flows are relatively low for a small advanced economy. People are sometimes surprised to learn that, but some of the other smaller economies that are closer to larger markets, they have a lot more cross-border flows. Uh, one of the reasons for that, in addition to our geographic isolation, is the uh, capital density in New Zealand, which is also low. Uh, the Productivity Commission's posited that that's one of the reasons behind our poor productivity record over recent decades. We have low per capita capital investment uh, in New Zealand, and they suggest, and I think they're right in this, that's actually one of the reasons why, in many sectors of our economy, diffusion of new technologies that are necessary in order to lift productivity have been slower than, uh, than we would like. And as a consequence of this, New Zealand's labour productivity is about 30% below the average for the OECD countries, the high income OECD countries that we would like to compare ourselves. Um, this has been true for quite a while. Uh, and in terms of the export, uh, exports as a percentage of our economy, uh, from 2008 to 2070, they dropped from 40% of GDP to 37% of GDP in the face of a target from the last government to lift them from 30% to 40% of GDP. <coughs> now, um, the export successes that we have had uh, haven't been uh, evenly distributed around the country, uh, uh, but I, overall I think uh, most would agree that we have to uh, do better to lift our, our export performance and we, you know, we've got a, a lot to say on that as we try to edge the country towards on this journey from volume to value, which I think we're on as a country. I think our country's on, the, on that journey. Now, uh, the, the, some of those stats are a bit gloomy, but there are always exceptions to the rule. And uh, the wood processing and manufacturing sector is actually one of those exceptions. It is quite a different uh, and very welcome story. And I know that we all bemoan uh, the, uh, the unprocessed log exports, and we should, and we should continue to. Um, but it's also true that we can celebrate the increasing quantity of manufactured wood products, uh, and uh, which add value before leaving New Zealand, uh, and also uh, celebrate the productivity story within wood manufacturing, which is pretty impressive. Manufacturing industries, and I wasn't here to hear the last speaker, but I, uh, I hear you said the same thing, no doubt more eloquently than me. But there, there are no doubt that manufacturing industries are central to the productivity of any modern economy. Uh, they're certainly central to our government's vision of improving the well-being and living standards of New Zealanders. Um, uh, because they help us achieve increases in productivity uh, and sustainable and inclusive growth. Uh, you know, the people that work in manufacturing industries are generally pretty well paid uh, and well paid than some, some people who are in some of the lower paid service industries. 
MB uh, reported last year that manufacturing in New Zealand generated 12% of GDP uh, and in 2018 wood processing contributed around $2.1 billion to the New Zealand economy. Wood processing is of course one of our key export sectors and accounts for 3.9% of uh, New Zealand's goods exports. Uh, and uh, quite importantly from our perspective the sector has to be recognised for its role in distributing the benefits of trade uh, and the economy to regional areas which is where these, uh, this processing generally takes place. Here in Canterbury, uh, wood processing and wood manufacturing directly contributed $221 million to the regional economy. That included $148 million in wages into Cantabrian's pockets uh, and uh, your uh, sector's contributions to the regional economy of course include the input that you've had to the rebuild following the earthquakes. Across New Zealand, uh, manufacturing employs 241,000 workers including over 21,000 in wood processing uh, and these are, these are generally well paying jobs. 42% of um, uh, New Zealand's R&D expenditure, and that's more than $670 million per annum of private sector R&D, 42% uh, uh, of the total comes from manufacturers. Uh, it's quite an astounding percentage actually when you reflect on the early stats I had as to the part that manufacturing plays in the economy, which is certainly a lot less than 42%. And as you know better than anyone else, the manufacturing industry, uh, of course, faces a great deal of global competition, uh, and we already suffer some disadvantages, as well as on occasions advantages, but in your sector, mainly disadvantages from being a small remote country uh, with a limited domestic market. Of course, the most important way to improve competitiveness uh, of an economy, particularly internationally, is to boost productivity. And in the past decade, labour productivity in manufacturing has grown 5.6% as a whole. Uh, but I'm told that in wood processing, labour productivity over the same period has grown 17%, close to three times the New Zealand average. Uh, further, multi-factor productivity driven by technological change has grown 27% in this sector over the past decade, compared with 1.2% for manufacturing as a whole. So you're obviously doing some things right. And we want to assist our economy uh, on this journey that I think we're underway from volume to value um, because it of course helps maximise the value of our primary products and moves us to also assist us moving to more sustainable land use practices, diversifies our economy uh, and increases the competitiveness of our industry. Um, so I think it's important that we celebrate successes such as yours and recognise the gains that have been made by your industry. Forestry and wood processing are priorities industries for the government for a number of reasons, not just economic, partly environmental. And I'd, likely to, I'd like to share briefly some of the initiatives that we have underway to support, support uh, that growth in your sector. Um, Shane Jones, your forestry minister, has recently renewed uh, th effort by the government setting up Te Uru Raikau, Raikau, sorry, uh, to drive the Billion Trees initiative. We've of course committed to that Billion Trees initiative. Uh, and we're also rehabilitating the emissions trading scheme which has um, suffered a recent illness uh, um, yeah. but is being uh, restored to its original health. Um, uh, the government's refocusing its approach to uh, industry policy. Uh, we've agreed to engage more strategically across uh, portfolios with key sectors in the economy so that we can take a coordinated approach. Uh, and we want to partner with industry uh, and uh, focus on sector and firm level initiatives that will support and incentivise industry to develop or, or introduce new technologies as they shift into higher value, more productive, more knowledge intensive activities. Uh, an important uh, part of this comes from innovation. To encourage innovation we've introduced a tax credit of 15% of R&D expenditure. We campaigned on 12.5%, we actually always knew it should be 15 we weren't sure that we could afford it. but once we got there we managed to balance the budget and still do that so we bumped it up to 15%. And this encourages uh, further investment to grow new points of comparative advantage. And those points of comparative advantage, not always but ordinarily, they're adjacent to current areas of strength, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why uh, you guys are so successful at building on existing strength in order to 
to, uh, to improve further. The Ministry of Primary Industries has recently commissioned work to inform the logistics of log supply to processing operations. It's a practical uh, endeavour and it will help to identify options to improve log supply conditions, thereby assisting both growers and processors. We've prioritised investing in New Zealand's regions, as you'll be aware, uh, and uh, these of course are key areas for wood processing and that Provincial Growth Fund has been established to help do that. Uh, uh, there are opportunities through that fund for industry to make uh, changes in the production systems in a way that remain that are consistent with our international commitments. We don't want to run into our WTO complications, and I'm agreed, uh, aware that the WPMA is currently working on an application to develop a New Zealand wood timber design centre. Uh, Minister Jones and, and myself, but particularly uh, Shane, are keen to hear your views about how the fund could help develop innovative solutions to lift performance and productivity in your industry. We're also addressing workforce uh, challenges by making tertiary education, uh, training and apprenticeship more accessible, um, uh, not just by eliminating fees for those starting out, which we've started to do, but also through some reforms to the polytech and trade sector that we're trying to work out. The polytech sector has actually been getting more and more money and training fewer and fewer people. Um, uh, New Zealand's move towards a low emissions economy will also provide clear incentives for additional investment in forestry and wood processing. Uh, we're also interested in exploring ways that we might transition away from looking at wood only for its physical attributes, not, not only for its physical attributes, but also seeing it in terms of its chemical uh, attributes. And uh, over time we hope to see growth opportunities in biomaterials and biofuels. Last year's Overseas Investment Act uh, uh, amendments encouraged investment in forestry. We have been deliberate in tightening rules on overseas ownership of farms in horticulture uh, and in residential land, uh, housing because we didn't think there were net benefits to the country there. Uh, but at the same time we're very careful uh, to consult widely with the forest industry as we loosened rules for forest investment. And I know a lot of the, those in the room were involved in, in those uh, consultations and there were a wide range of views expressed from uh, different sectors uh, uh, in the forest industry, um, but I think we landed at a reasonably sensible place. The second phase of that work's now underway. Uh, it's got a couple of, uh, couple of aims. We're trying to reduce complexity and cut unnecessary red tape, which actually doesn't now lie in the forestry space, um, but still lies in other areas. But we also want to ensure that we've got adequate protections in place to make sure that new investments that are allowed uh, or that should not be allowed if they're inconsistent with the New Zealand national interest can be turned down. We're a bit underdressed in that space at the moment as a country. And a discussion document on that phase two will be published soon and I hope some of you will contribute to that consultation. I'll now put on another hat which is uh, trade and export growth and uh, outline some of the current challenges that we've got to the global trading system and how the government's responding to that. Uh, I'm acutely aware that success in our offshore markets is affected by stability of the global trading environment. Um, and, and by that I'm not really meaning the health of international economies, although that is plainly relevant too. I'm more uh, referring to uh, the openness of other countries to trade. For more than two decades New Zealand's trade policy has uh, been reliant on two key assumptions. The first was that global market openness would continue to increase, and the second was that the rules-based uh, trading system would strengthen. Uh, now recent tensions are challenging both of those assumptions, and the past two years we've seen the steepest increase in protectionist measures around the world since the establishment of the World Trade Organization. Fortunately, we haven't seen a wave of countries uh, turning to protectionism writ large, uh, but the risks of rising protectionism are very, very real. And we've got a six-part strategy for managing these, this turbulence, really. Um, first, we're actively defending the rules-based system. These are the international trade rules, and, and these are actually the most important bedrock for us uh, and crucial to New Zealand. They are delivering, they deliver the, the certainty of trading conditions 
that we need between the 164 WTO members. And there's no first best alternative to that. And we're doing our utmost uh, to protect those rules in, in lots, of, lots of ways. I won't go into the detail. Um, secondly, we're participating in regional agreements, which are the next line of insurance, really, with key trading partners to bolster commitments that countries already have made to us in the WTO. But if they become unenforceable in the WTO, you need a bit of insurance. Uh, for example, we recently concluded CPTPP, we've got RCEP still under negotiation. Uh, and to, to, to show how real this is, I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of what's happened in CPTPP. In the month of January, the quantity of New Zealand's beef exports to Japan increased threefold relative to the prior year, threefold. Our butter exports to Canada jumped sixfold compared with the same period a year earlier. Now both of those were probably slightly exaggerated by people holding back product for the, the tariff um, reductions, but it's an astounding rate of change even if you say that it was slightly exaggerated. And I think those uh, show how uh, differences in tariffs compared with competitor countries are just so influential on the ability of New Zealand enterprises to compete into those markets. Um, so um, these agreements really are increasingly an, an important second line of defence. So too are our bilateral free trade agreements. Um, thirdly, we want to reinforce global and regional institutions which help safeguard social, economic and political progress. And the multilateral institutions at the moment in the world are, are not just the WTO, but a lot of them, they're, they're, a lot of them are under threat. Uh, and so we support some of the secondary organisations that support them. You know, I mean secondary to the UN. Organisations like the OECD, APEC and the Commonwealth. And if, if like-minded countries can come together through those organisations uh, and bolster support for the global institutions, then the global institutions have a better chance of, of um, being preserved. Fourth, uh, we want to pursue flexible and open negotiating approaches that align up, allow others to join in. Because as the WTO sort of has become less effective, uh, for example, it hasn't been able to agree electronic commerce uh, rules for the internet age. Um, and so countries have said, well, we've got to try some other way of getting to new rules on that. And so we've, we're, we're clubbing together with other like-minded partners to do it. But we want to do that in a way that is flexible and open to others. There are others that would prefer these to be closed clubs. We don't think that's in New Zealand's interest. So we're, we're pursuing agreements like the e-commerce negotiations that have been recently launched with over 70 uh, members at the WTO. And we also like terms and free trade agreements, as with CPTPP, that have accession clauses that encourage other people to join in so long as they meet the, the high standards of the incumbents. Fifthly, we're developing a trade for all agenda in consultation with New Zealanders. Now this is really important. We've got to uh, uh, show to New Zealanders that, that the benefits of trade flow to all uh, if we're to avoid a, a, a rising resentment uh, in New Zealand that has been seen in other countries. And we, with this, we've been pretty successful at this since we came to government trying to uh, demonstrate that the benefits of trade should flow to all. That trade agreements just aren't for the benefit of multinationals. That they flay, you know, they work from the sort of the farm owner to the, to the, you know, the worker in the in the in the wood processing factory to, um, to the multinational. Everyone can benefit, and we're trying to facilitate entry into trade for smaller businesses, for women, for indigenous groups, just to ensure that our growth is inclusive. Uh, and uh, to push against this view that it's just for multinationals. Sixth, we're working with uh, New Zealand's network of embassies and high commissions around the world to provide uh, information and analysis that help Kiwi businesses succeed in international markets and provide insights and advice to our policymakers. I I'm responsible for NZTE and with my MB hat on, and I've got to say I've had to change virtually nothing in it. I thought Stephen Joyce did an exceptional job of uh, taking that forward. It's got a great chief executive and a guy, Peter Crisp, uh, and we've, we've left that unchanged, essentially. Uh, and it's, it does really good work, uh, and it really helps our rapidly expanding
companies uh, that aren't yet big enough to have institutional form to make their own way unguided abroad um, and need a help, a helping hand and NZTE is very effective at that. As a consequence some of our high growth companies really are growing at quite a, a good rate and uh, growing not just in sales but in uh, overseas personnel as they internationalise their businesses. So this is, a, this, is, this is a huge amount of detailed work that lies under this, uh, uh, these six elements, and they, they actually represent a lot of government spending. A lot of your taxes are now spent on this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, Winston Peters got a pretty hefty increase for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade at the end of last year, or the last year's budget, which is helping us do that. We do think uh, that New Zealand has a slightly disproportionate role in the world when it comes to pushing against this rising tide of protectionism uh, and we in times like this rely upon our reputation for fairness uh, and, and balance as we respond as best we can to these external factors and help the world go in a direction that we at least try and put a bit of pressure on to get going in the right direction. Now uh, many people in the room here have raised with me the other pressure points in the international context. Uh, as they relate to wood processing and manufacturers and sectors in New Zealand. In particular, we've heard that other countries' domestic policies make overseas wood processing sectors un un unfairly competitive relative to you. Uh, and that the cumulative effect of these defensive policy settings for manufacturing sectors abroad makes conditions increasingly difficult for the manufacturing sector at home. Um, we are uh, committed, and, our, and the last government was too, to doing uh, our utmost to reduce such non-tariff barriers as well as the tariffs that affect your sector and I want to mention a few of the ways that we're trying to do that including through our tra trade negotiations and also through some of the research that we have underway on global subsidies which is which is work that we've kicked off. Um, CPTPP uh, of course entered into first and will save 92 million dollars in tariffs this year alone this will increase to $222 million per annum once the deal is fully implemented. All tariffs on New Zealand forestry and forest products will be eliminated through CPTPP to those countries, most notably in Japan and Vietnam. Um, tariff savings are about $10 million per annum, but as you all know, it's not just the tariff savings, it's actually it's the volume growth that you can achieve if you're competitive uh, with competitors uh, from other countries, as is shown in those figures that have probably more extreme, but that I quoted for beef into Japan and butter into Canada. Um, in terms of our current negotiations with the European Union, collectively they're our third largest trading partner with, uh, uh, with $16 billion per annum. And that negotiation has been underway for nine months, some of the priorities including reducing tariffs and non-tariff barriers and uh, securing outcomes that open up greater potential. Uh, both for sales and also for greater collaboration with the EU, which we think could benefit the New Zealand industry. We're in upgrade negotiations for the China-New Zealand FTA. We want to secure even greater market access. Uh, it's already our largest customer for wood products. Uh, $3 billion worth went there last year. Um, uh, we accept that tariffs on processed wood and paper products reinforce our reliance on uh, sales of unprocessed logs and disincentivise value being added by processing and manufacturing sectors in New Zealand. Uh, so for this reason, wood and paper products remain key good uh, market access priority for us in the upgrade. So we're doing our best there. We also seek to improve the rules that govern trade in goods, uh, making it uh, easier to participate in Chinese value chains. For example, we're looking to create new rules that will facilitate customs clearance at Chinese ports and help exporters participate in Chinese supply chains. Uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of a taste of what we're doing through trade agreements to remove barriers to trade with some of your major markets. Some of you have also expressed concerns to me about subsidy practices in other countries. Uh, and at my direction, uh, officials have been analysing the effect of global subsidies on the price of logs for New Zealand manufacturing and processing industry. Uh, MB's led an initial review of investigations conducted by other jurisdictions into wood processing subsidisation in third party countries. Uh, the results have not uh, conclusively pointed to high levels of distortion, but it's clear that international complexities present cumulative challenges for New Zealand exports. You've also heard today from John Bellingall, whose team of export 
economist is going to look uh, to bring even more uh, clarity to the issue. When these reviews have been completed, I think both industry and government will have a clearer sense of the effect of the global subsidies, which will help us to determine how best to respond to the challenges. Uh, we welcome industry's continued engagement in this process, and indeed that work actually came of a meeting that I had with John Tanner in, in my office when we had MFAT officials uh, in the office and the Deputy Secretary of um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Vangelis Vitalis, uh, having heard what was said and with, with, my, with my support agreed to kick off that work. So, um, you know, the levies that you pay to employ Dr. John Tanner are obviously worthwhile. <laughs> What's that? You wrote that's not even. It's no. You must have told me because it's not written down. <laughs> um, so uh, we welcome engagement in this process. Uh, no one knows your sector like you do, uh, and we rely on your advice, your insights, and your suge suggestions for constructive ways to engage on the issues. And on that, I have had some really constructive ideas from members of your industry as to how how we engage our international partners and how we can find a way forward on those issues. So that's, um, that's all I've got to say here. I'm happy to answer questions, but I know that you've had a long time and uh, um, uh, you might want to go and do other things, so I won't be offended if there's no questions, but I'm happy to answer them if there are.